But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us Mr. Albert Burgess. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I have to tell you, I come with a health warning because everybody I met in my life called Albert is completely and utterly stark raving mad. And I will give you an example of that. I was walking up the Pentonville Road one night with my colleague Tony. Tony is a born traffic policeman. Um, uh, that means he's only got half a brain, really, but uh, he's quite a good friend of mine. And, and we were walking up the Pentonville Road and we saw these two cars full up with Asians which were leapfrogging up, up, up the road. So we thought we'd find out what they were up to and I stopped my car and he stopped his. And uh, I'm not a traffic policeman. Uh, so I very soon got fed up with the no English, only Hindi, no English, only Hindi. Um, and I wanted to go back. It was half past two in the morning and I was dying for a cup of tea. But Tony, being a born traffic policeman, he's going to report somebody for something. So I thought I'll give him a heavy hint. And I walked across the road. And as I was walking across the road, I saw this man walking down the road towards me. And he had a wallet in his hand and he had on the wallet a cigarette packet. Now, I don't smoke, so we'll have to do that. <coughs> and he was walking down the road like this. Half past two in the morning. And I went up to him and I said to him, good morning, sir. And he said, good morning, officer. I said, are you all right, old son? He said, I don't mind telling you I'm not. And I said to him, what's the problem? He said, I haven't had any sleep for three days. And I said, really? Why is that? He said, it's the entity. It's trying to kill me. I said, what entity is that? He said, it's the entity I've managed to trap in the cigarette packet. But if I go to sleep, I'll let go of it and he'll get out and he'll kill me. So I immediately realised that I had a place of safety arrest because you can't leave him going wandering around with no sleep forever. And so I said to him, well, how would you like to come for a nice ride in one of our police cars? And we can take you in the police station and we can throw the cigarette packet in one of our cells because all of our cells are entity proof. And he said to me, do you think that would work? I said, absolutely certain it will work. So I whistled up the van and the sergeant said, what you got, Albert? So I told him. So we put us in the van and we take him down the police station. When we got there, I walked into the custody area with this man and the sergeant behind the desk, the custody sergeant, said, what you got, Albert? And the other sergeant said, you don't want to know. I'll deal with it. And we sat down and <coughs> the sergeant walked over to one of these pedal bins, flipped the lid, pulled out a green first aid box, which was empty. And he said to the guy, now this is an entity proof box. That is an entity proof bin. If Albert stands by the bin, you put your hand in here. When I say now, let go of the cigarette pack and pull your hand out quick. So like, do you understand? Yeah, I understand. So, right, now, down comes the lid on the box. He throws it to me. I threw it in the bin, slammed the lid of the bin shut, and then the sergeant and I looked at one another. We went, phew, that was close. Now I've got to put pen to paper. And I said to the guy, what's your name, old son? And he said, Albert. And after that, I was known as Entity Albert throughout the rest of my time in the police station. But, I mean, basically, everybody I've ever met, as I say, called Albert, has been stark raving mad. Now, I was a special constable. Now, a special constable has all the powers and obligations and authority of a proper policeman or a regular policeman who gets paid, but you don't get paid. You do the same training, and a friend of mine who's a regular officer at Hendon Training School told me that they get better results out of special constables in the exams than they do out of a regular intake because the special constables do it because they're interested in doing it, not just because it's a job. But the police are there to uphold the law. But there are different kinds of law. There is the common law of England. There is constitutional law, which is supreme law and overrides everything else. And then there is statute law passed by Parliament. 
And in order to understand what this is all about, you have to understand our constitution and how it developed. Alfred the Great, when he became king of the English, put all of the laws, the best laws and customs from all of the various old kingdoms into one book of law called the Dome. He showed it to his Witten, which was his parliament, and he asked them if it was good law. And they agreed it was, and it was published as the King's Law and was the first ever book of constitutional law. And it was really quite enlightened. Because in it they said that if you are a widow, so you were married to a lord and you were a widow because somebody, you know, he died one way or another, normally your estate would revert back to the crown who would reallocate it. And you'd be out and you'd have to hope find somebody to mark it to you. But what normally would happen is the king would find, if you were 25 years old, young nubile widow, the king would find some 60-year-old git who he wanted on his side, and he'd marry you off to him. And Alfred actually put in his law, book of laws that a widow should not be forced to marry against her wishes. He was nice to you girls, wasn't he? Um, and also, you would keep the estate, and the estate would be run by you, and if you couldn't run it, then they'd appoint somebody to run it for you, but that person would not be answerable to the king, he'd be answerable to you. If you weren't happy, you contacted the king, and the king came and kicked him in the nuts or something, right? So basically, it was very enlightened law. Over the years, this has been repeated. It was repeated in the Charter of Liberties of Henry I in 1190, Magna Carta in 1215, 1628 Petition of Right, and the 1689 Bill of Rights. And basically, it's simply a repeat of the English law, and it's constitutional law, and it can't be repealed, and it is actually supreme law. Police officers, unfortunately, are not trained in constitutional law. The only common law they are trained in is breach of the peace. But when you're a police officer and they say to you, this is the law of breach of the peace, but you can't use it. Because you are there, your primary role is to prevent breaches of the peace. So if you arrest somebody for a breach of the peace, you've actually failed to prevent a breach of the peace and that's neglect of duty, so if you arrest him for a breach of the peace, you yourself are in trouble. Use the Public Order Act instead. And then of course they enforce statute law, and the statute law is stuff like the Road Traffic Act and things like that. Now, a statute law cannot be used to repeal a constitutional law. So when the Bill of Rights says that you cannot suffer any fine or forfeiture unless you have been found guilty of an offence in a court of law, and Tony Blair's government come along and say, if you don't pay the road tax on your car, we will seize it and crush it, the statute is overridden and voided by the constitutional law. However, government are ignoring our constitutional law. That's no reason why police officers should. We have here this thing for the inquiring minds. And on it, you have a policeman in the old style uniform with his shirt sleeves out, it's a nice sunny day wandering around, being nice to people and smiling at everybody he meets, patting all the dogs, kissing all the children and doing the things that the police normally would be known for doing. On the other side, you have a policeman with a fluorescent jacket on, so he's never going to catch anybody committing crime because he's brilliant up like a Christmas tree, so you're never going to see him. Uh, he's never going to get close enough to see you committing crime because you can see him three miles away. And he's got CS gas and a big truncheon and everything else on him which makes him really difficult. And basically, you give him a bulletproof vest as well, so what you've got is a paramilitary. And that's what you see on your streets today. Now over here, it says, I have to put my glasses on for this, because frankly I'm going blind. Corporate employee, revenue collector, and to enforce statutes. Now, <coughs> that's actually not true. Every police officer in this country is answerable to the law and only to the law. His sergeant and his chief constable are merely administrative ranks in the police service 
and have nothing whatsoever to do with the enforcement of law. They get that right by the virtue of the fact that they hold the ancient and honourable office of constable. And all constables are the same. There's no difference. Every one of them has exactly the same authority. It doesn't matter if you're a chief constable with 35 years experience or a brand new trainee who's just done his six months training in the, in the police college and it's your first day on the street. You all have exactly the same powers, exactly the same rights, exactly the same obligations. And your obligations, i.e. the duties of a constable, are very simple. I like simple, simple is easy. The preservation of life, the protection of property, the detecting of offences and the putting before the courts of offenders. That is the description of a police officer. That is his job description. Nothing else, that is his job description. Now, a few years back, they brought out this silly system. They did it when I was policing and it came as a point system. If you gave out a fixed penalty ticket which was endorsable, you were awarded three points. If you caught a rapist who'd raped a dozen women, you were awarded three points. And you were considered to be a good police officer if you got loads of points. So consequently, they've slanted the policeman's mindset into collecting points. Now, frankly, there aren't many multiple rapists out there. And, but there are lots of cars. So if you want to be seen as a good policeman, you stand on a corner and you wait for people to jump a set of traffic lights and then you give them an endorsable fixed penalty ticket. And if you stand there for eight hours and you give out eight fixed penalty tickets, one an hour, You've got a lot of points, and you are a brilliant policeman. Around the corner, of course, people are getting mugged, houses are getting burgled, cars are being suffering criminal damage and being stolen, but you are a good copper because you've got lots of points. The chief constable's job, on the other hand, is to put pen in the, ink in the paper, ink in the pens, paper on the table for you to write on, and petrol in the tanks and tyres on the cars so that you can get around. That is his sole job in life. Now, <coughs> unfortunately, the days when policemen understood this and the days when policemen would actually stand up and argue about things are going because the whole thing is being dumbed down. And it's being dumbed down in a number of ways. For example, when I took my oath of attestation, <coughs> I swore, I, I, whatever my name is, or whatever my address is, do solemnly and sincerely declare, aff declare and affirm that I will well and truly serve our Sovereign Lady the Queen in the office of constable without favour or affection, malice or ill will, ill will. Right? And that I will protect the su Her Majesty's subjects and their property, basically. That was my oath. I swore it to a sovereign queen. But in 2002, with the Police Reform Act, they changed it. So I now do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that I will well and truly serve the Queen in the office of Constable. Note the loss of the words Sovereign Lady. Now, <laughs> that is quite important because if you remember Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, when the King was alive, King George VI, she was Queen but she was not Sovereign, he was. And Queen Elizabeth, because she is queen and sovereign, she is a sovereign queen. But we've left it out in the new oath. And that, in fact, comprises the criminal offence under the 1351 Treason Act and the 1848 Treason Felony Act of removing the style and honour of the queen, which is an act of treason. 
So everybody now who administers this oath is committing treason. And every police officer who swears this oath, that's everybody since the 2002 Police Reform Act came into office, is committing treason. So when you are stopped out there by some 20-year-old policeman, you can guarantee that he is not a policeman. And he's not a policeman because he took an oath which was treasonable and therefore he can't possibly be a policeman. And when he takes you to court and he stands up and gives his evidence, you can stand up and say, hold on a minute. He's not a fit person to give evidence because he's committed treason. And you can prove it because you've got the oath there and you've got the Treason and Felony Act of 1848 and you've got the 1351 Treason Act which will tell you he has committed treason. Now, the Queen is being moved out of sight. We get a lot of people come along and say, why doesn't the Queen do something? Because constitutionally the Queen has a lot of power. A tremendous amount of power, a tremendous amount of authority. And, but what's happened is in 1911, the Asquith government, one of their ministers told King George V when he came to the throne, you keep all of your prerogatives, but you can't use any of them unless you have the backing of a government minister. Well, of course, <laughs> that means you can't use any of them, which means you haven't got them. And instead of King George V doing what he should have done, which he sent for his guard commander and have the man consigned to the tower until he could remove his head from his shoulders, he accepted it. So by that time, of course, King George VI thought it was normal and the Queen thinks it's normal. And if you write to the Queen today and you complain about something, she'll say to you in, your, in the letter you get back, this is a matter for my ministers. Is it hell? It's a matter for her. But she's been brainwashed from birth to believe that she has no say. So basically, our police force are there to serve our Sovereign Lady the Queen in the office of constable and protect all of you. But government, parliament, the House of Commons in fact, have actually removed the Queen's powers and assumed it themselves. And they say to you, well, because you elect us to parliament, you give us your sovereignty. But that's not the way it works. When the Queen went for her coronation, your parents and mine, because we were all young then, handed our sovereignty over to the Queen to administer on our behalf, but only ever in our best interests. How many things today are government doing which you consider to be actually in your best interests? None of them. None of them. So you do the normal thing and you go to your local police station and you say, I've been burgled. I'd like to report a crime. And they say to you, you don't report crime here. You have to phone this number. And they give you an 0845 number. Which means, in fact, not only have you been burgled and lost all of your best worldly belongings, but you've actually got to pay for the privilege of reporting it to a policeman. Not only that, <coughs> when nothing happens and you go down and you say, why aren't you investigating my burglary? They will say to, we don't have to. You say, what do you mean you don't have to? You're a policeman, I've been burgled, I'm a victim, it's your job to find out who did it and put them before the courts. And they say, no, 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 no. We don't have to do that. We get to decide which crimes we investigate and which crimes we don't. And I, in one of my letters to the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police, when he said that to me, I wrote back and I said, look, that's complete rubbish. You couldn't possibly find a body floating down the river with no hands and no head and decide because of the, and gunshot wounds to his body and find that because of the fact that he would be difficult to identify and therefore it's costly to identify him and it, if you can't identify him it's going to be difficult, more difficult and more expensive to catch who did it that you aren't going to bother trying and just to rub it in the almighty who I'm told is a friend of mine 
provided a body minus its head and its hands a week later, but with stab wounds, not gunshot wounds, to its body scattered all over the country. And lo and behold, the police investigated it and made an arrest. Now, our job as members of the public is to remind the police that they work for us. It is our taxes which pay their wages. And it is our best interests which they have to have at heart. We all know, don't we, that the politicians have robbed us blind. Don't we? And we all know that the police are standing there with their hands in their pockets. They said, nothing to do with us. Parliamentary standards, you know, nothing to do with us. Theft is theft is theft is theft. One of my annual reports said, Albert thinks in black and white. He has to learn there are shades of grey. Well, I don't accept that. Shades of grey is when people get away with things. The other thing that they do in policing today, uh, when I joined Thames Valley Police from the Metropolitan Police, they said to me, when we go out, if something is happening, and there are more of them than there are of us, we let them carry on. That's not what you're playing the police force are, is it? That, you're not paying them for that. You don't want your police force to go out and get killed. You don't want it. I guarantee you, nobody in this room wants to go out and see policemen getting killed. But, if a gang of blokes have dragged this lady here into a churchyard and a gang raping her, you expect that police officer to get killed trying to save her if that's what it takes, don't you? You expect it. It's part of the job. It's part and parcel of the job. So you have to make your police force do their job. How do you do that? How do you do it? Well, what you do is you look at the police force and you say, I've, I've, I'm a victim of a crime. I report that crime. And the first thing the police force will say to you today is, we'll give you a crime reference number. And you say, I don't want a crime reference number, I want a crime book number. Because unless there's a crime book number on it, it's not a crime. It doesn't appear in the statistics. So if you've got 100 burglaries in a particular area, and they give out three crime book numbers, as far as the statistic is concerned, you've only had three burglaries. The other 97 forget about, because nobody's ever going to look at them. When I was policing, if I went to a burglary, I would go and I'd see the victim and do all the necessary with the victim. I would then go and knock on every door on both sides of the street. Did you see anything? If they'd come in through the back garden, I'd walk round the block and I'd go and knock on every door that overlooked the back gardens. I never once went out and did that and did not find somebody who could give me a description of somebody they didn't like the look of. I never did. Today, you report a burglary, you don't even see a policeman. They take it over the phone, for which you are paying. And you might get a crime record number and you might get a crime book number, that depends upon how kind they are feeling that particular day. You must insist on getting a crime book number. And if you don't get a crime book number, you find out who's not giving you the crime book number and you put a report into them for a about them for a neglect of duty. It's easy. That then, in fact, goes to the complaints department. But when you fill in the form, the inspector will say to you, are you prepared to accept a local resolution? The answer is absolutely not on your life. Because if you say yes, the policeman will come along and say, I'm sorry you're not happy with what I'm doing. Goodbye, and that's the end of the subject. But if in fact you say no, they have to then hold a completely open and above board inquiry into that man's conduct. They should come along and interview you. They don't always, they should, but that in itself is a neglect of duty if they don't. And basically what we do is we actually get into policing in that way and that's what we do.
Now, what I'm going to do <coughs> is I'm going to tell you a few stories about policing, things that I have done as a police officer. And you see what the way policing should be done. I was off duty one day, and I had an old lady on my beat. I'd had to go down the police station and sign some paperwork, and she was only 100 yards up the road, and being an old lady, she didn't eat too well and all the rest of it, and she was a bit suicidal, so I was a home beat officer at the time, so I would actually walk in and see her and have a cup of tea and a chat for two or three times a week with her just to keep her on the straight and level. And I thought, well, I don't know. She don't eat very well. I'll take her up some cod and chips. And I was waiting in the queue in the fish shop, and I can hear this tumult come out the road. And being policeman and naturally nosy, I walk out the door. And I looked up the street, and there were a dozen punk rockers walking down the road, all with a blip obligatory bottle of Old English and one of them, every time he passed a car, he would take a running kick at it. Now, <coughs> we are policemen all human and I used to park my motorcycle on a motorcycle bicycle park outside my house along with about 40 other people and I would go out in the morning and find somebody who played dominoes by knocking them all over and so you'd have to pick them all up until you got to your one, and of course there's no point in stopping then, so you pick them all up, and then you go back to your one and you find you've had an indicator light knocked off it. Now it's only eight quid, not a great deal of money, but it's eight quid every bloody week. And that does build up to a lot of money, so you can understand that I actually quite wanted to feel the collar of somebody committing criminal damage to a motor vehicle. So I've walked up the road, I'm off duty, I've got no radio, I've got no truncheon, I've got no hang... Well, I had a pair of handcuffs in my pocket because I always carried them. And <coughs> I was ever the optimist, you see. And so, <laughs> so I walk up the road and I put the warrant card up in front of this idiot's face and I said to him, can you tell me, I'm a police officer, which of these cars do you own? He said, oh, I don't own any of them. I said, in that case, can you tell me, please, why it is that you've kicked the hole in the side of this Alfa Romeo here? Nice, bright, red, shiny Alfa Romeo with a beautiful dent in the door panel. And he said, I didn't do it. So I said, that'll do me. I'm arresting you for criminal damage to a motor vehicle. And the other 11 punk rockers, they said, you can't arrest him. If you've got to arrest him, you've got to arrest us all. And I said, even that can be arranged. Now get out of my way and I've got him loosely in an arm lock and I walked him off down the road. And they had a little conference and they ran round in front of me between me and the police station and I was outside the Royal Scott Hotel at King's Cross which is a nice pebble da pebble dashed wall and this bloke with a beard, he looked a bit like Cat Weasel on one side, the other one side was completely clean shaven, the other side was a very long beard. And he said to me, he said, you're not taking him. I said, get out of my way or I will arrest you. And he said, you're not taking him. And he walked forward and he grabbed the bloke by the shirt and he said, come on, Pat, you're coming with us. Now, Pat, who I had in an arm lock, started to walk away. So I transferred the arm lock and converted it into the full body slam. And I put Pat on the floor. And oh, dearie me, accidentally, completely unintentionally, he hopped his head off the pebble dash wall. You've never seen so much blood on the pavement. He sandpapered the top off his head. And I reached up and grabbed Cat Weasel by the beard, yanked him forward on top of Pat, dropped down on top of Pat with the Cat Weasel with my knee on the middle of his back, put my hand in my raincoat pocket, pulled out the handcuffs like a pair of knuckle dusters and said, right now, which of you bastards is next? And they ran away. So I hit Pat and, hooked Pat and Cat Weasel together and wandered them into the police station. The problem with policing today is policemen are nervous. They won't get out of their car if there's a pub fight. Somebody might hit them. They won't get involved because they might get hurt. It's this health and safety kick that they're going on. That's why they walk around in full body armour. And if you think the bit you can see is ridiculous, you should see the boxes and the knee shin pads and the elbow pads that they're wearing underneath the rest of their uniform. You know, if it was steel plate, they could be qualified. All they need is a sword and they'd be a fully, fully fledged equipped knight. But basically, they won't get involved. It's wrong. 
What you have to do as a police officer is exude confidence. I had a man on my beat, we called him Tiny. He was seven foot three inches tall, he weighed 30 stone. He pimped for his sister, which shows what a charming fellow he was. And he regularly used to go around and rob the punters of the prostitutes. And it took 12 police officers to, to arrest him one day. And Tiny was being so violent that my friend Gripper, who was a heavyweight boxer for the police, took one of the old lignum vita truncheons lifted it up and hit him right on the head with it as hard as he could, which was very hard, and it never phased him. And I used to follow Tiny around when, he was on, when I was on duty, and he'd say to me, you're following me? And I'd say, correct. And he'd say to me, that's harassment. And I'd say, by God, you're a bright lad. That's absolutely correct. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, Tiny, you know you're an arse, and I know you're an arse, and you're going to be a well-behaved arse while I'm on duty. And he used to look at me, and then again, it took 12 policemen to arrest him. And he used to look at me as though to say, I want to hit him. But he doesn't look worried. I wonder if he's XSAS or something and could kill me with his little finger. And he never, ever made to hit me. And I would follow him around all night long, everywhere he went. And eventually he got fed up and he'd go home, which was great. And basically, what it is, <coughs> it's confidence. You have to exude confidence as a police officer. Now, you see police officers walking around two and three at a time, don't you? Because they won't police on their own. And yet, from your point of view as a taxpayer, one policeman can walk down your road, one policeman can walk down that road, and another policeman can walk down that road, and they see three times as much, and they keep down three times as much crime. And that surely is the object of the exercise. It's to keep the crime down. Now, <coughs> I used to walk around, I never ever wore a fluorescent jacket. My sergeant used to go ballistic at me, you've got to wear your fluorescent jacket. So I refused to wear a fluorescent jacket. They gave me a bulletproof vest. I had one of the old fashioned ones. It was a white thing, you wore it under your shirt. It had Kevlar to stop the bullets. And underneath the Kevlar, to stop the knives, there was like plate armour. All little links of little plates linked together with little chain links. And it was heavy, and it was hot, and it was uncomfortable. And if you happen to get into a police car and sit down, it used to come up bosh and cut your throat off at the jaw. I never wore it. It stayed in my locker the whole time. You don't need it. A police officer's uniform is better than a suit of armour. The number of people who will actually assault a police officer is minimal. It's getting more and more. And it's getting more and more because the police officers are getting more and more timid. And people think, well, you can see he's a bit worried, so I'm going to push this to the limit. And they do. I used to have a friend of mine, he's walking down the road and there was a gang of yobs there and they were all giving him a lot of mouth. And as he walked through, one of them, the big one, the mouthy one, barged into him. He grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, he threw him up against the nearest wall, and he said, right, I'll give you one chance. Go home now. Or I'm going to take you down the police station and your head's going to beat off every wall all the way. The rest of the gang just stood there gobsmacked. Because how can one policeman on his own walk in and pick the gang leader up and hop him off a wall in front of all of them? He must have something that they don't know about that makes him unafraid of the gang. And all in fact it is, is a brave front. You're just putting on a front. You are showing confidence. And you will never, as a police officer, hit problems if you show confidence. 
You see pub fights, don't you? You see it on the television all the time in these police programmes. Where the police arrive at the pub and there's all these drunken yobs lying around fighting all over the place and the police dive in mob handed and start dragging people up and then the girlfriends come in, leave him alone, leave him alone and then somebody comes and drags them away and before you know where you are you've got the next best thing to a riot on your hands. You see it on the telly, don't you? I was driving down the road one night in a police car 40 blokes came galloping out of a pub, start fighting on the pavement. I said to the driver of the police car, stop the car. He was a Sri Lankan special constable. And he said, no, we've got this call to do. I said, stop the car. He said, no, no, we've got this call to do. I said, stop the bloody car now. And he stopped the car and I've got out, walked up the road, <coughs> stood in the middle of the road, clapping. They stop and look at me. I said to him, I can see you guys have had a nice night tonight. It's time to go home. They looked at me, I'm standing there, I'm policeman in uniform, no hat, still in the car. And they looked up the road, there's no policeman, they looked down the road, my Sri Lankan friend had pulled the car around the corner so he couldn't see what was going on. When I got back to him, he was said fast, he sat in the car with his white knuckles off the wheel, the car as he could grit it. And I, <laughs> they start fighting again. So I clapped my hands again. But you boys are not understanding what I'm saying to you. You can either sleep in your own beds tonight, or you can, I can allocate you one down the police station. I couldn't care less. I'm here till six o'clock in the morning. Makes no difference to me. At least if I'm in the police station doing the paperwork, I'm drinking lots of tea and I'm nice and warm, instead of being out here on a cold night. And they looked and they thought, okay, we'll go home. And two blokes who've been fighting start walking off together. I said, oi, 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 come on, you go that way, you're going that way. Yeah, but I live that way. Yeah, I know, but you're going home the pretty way tonight. I said, what do you mean? I live that way. I said, if you make any move to go in that direction, I will arrest you to prevent a breach of the peace. I'm not having this fight start round the corner. And eventually they all go. Then a publican came out to me and he said to me, oh, officer, I'm so glad you're here. There's a man in my pub, he's done five of my bouncers this week, I want him out. So I said, what's his name? He said, Harry. So I said, OK, let's go and see him. Point him out to me. So he went in there, points him out, walked over to Harry, who was in the middle of an argument with this very tall guy. And I walked over and I said, evening, Harry. He looked at me, he said, you're a policeman? I said, yeah, I am, Harry. I'm a policeman with a problem you can help me with. And he said, what's that? He said, the publican doesn't want you in here, so I've been asked to escort you out. So he said, can I finish me beer? I said, well, you paid for it. Get it down in one and you can finish it and wash it down. He said, can I get me coat? I said, well, it's no good to anybody else, Harry. Picks up his coat and we walk out the door. As we're walking out the front door, along come three territorial support group vans. About 45 policemen come galloping through the doors, led by an inspector, truncheons at the ready. Where's the fight? Where's the fight? Where's the fight? There was no fight. It was all dealt with. But every time you see on the television, don't you, massive fights because these people jump out of vans and go belting into action without asking any questions. How many of you watch drink drivers being arrested on the television? Come on, you must have, right? Every single drink driver you see arrested on the television in this country, that arrest is illegal. And I'll tell you why. What do they do? They stop the car, the bloke falls out the car, and they say, right, I want you to blow into my machine. Don't they? And the guy blows into the machine and it goes red, and then they arrest him because he's provided a positive sample of breath, and he's off down the police station. It was illegal from minute one. Because when you stop a car and you want to breathalyze the driver, there is a little legal formula that you have to give him. Because I suspect you to have been driving a motor vehicle on a road or other public place whilst having consumed intoxicating liquor, are you, I require you to take a breath test. And unless the policeman says that, he hasn't made the requirement. So this blow into my machine isn't legal. Therefore the arrest isn't legal. Therefore everything that happens in the police station isn't legal. Therefore, you get away with it in court because you stand up and say there was no requirement to actually 
give a breath test. You get people, normally policemen, you know, it happened with a superintendent, fell out of his car, rip-roaring drunk, and instead of the police officers arresting him for Section 4 of the Road Traffic Act of 1988, which is being incapable of driving a car because you're drunk, for which case they don't need anything, they just say, well, he's laying on the floor, he's too drunk to drive, he's nicked, right? Instead of doing that, the guy crawls out the car and he says to the officers, 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 I'm drunk, you better give me a breath test. So the officer, thinking this is Christmas, goes over and says, right, blow into this. When they get him down the police station, the superintendent, who is well drunk, says to the custody sergeant, sergeant, there was no requirement to make the breath test. I told them I wanted to take it. And the sergeant said to the policeman, is that true? And he said, yes. So the sergeant said, right, take this gentleman anywhere he wants to go because the breath test was not legal. You never see any of that on the television policing programmes, do you? Like police stop and all that. You don't, do you? You see other things on the police that on the television programmes where the police walking down the road and they see a couple of little lads and they say, right, come on, George, turn your pockets out, turn your pockets out. If he's got half a pound of heroin in each pocket, it is not worth a thing as evidence because under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, a police officer who wishes to conduct in a search in the street has to have reasonable grounds for believing that he will find something on that person which he shouldn't have. It could be drugs, it could be knives, it could be anything. Stolen property, whatever it is, it could be there. But they walk over and they say, come on, turn your pockets out and they turn their pockets out and then they arrest them because they've got a pen knife in their pocket or whatever it is. Now, what you're supposed to do is say to the man, my name is PC so-and-so and I am from Kentish Town Police Station or wherever it is you happen to be from. I re require you to submit to a search because I suspect you to have on your person property which is prohibited, I oil drugs or whatever it is. But it doesn't stop there, because anybody could just go up and say that, couldn't they? But that degree of suspicion has to be such that I as a police officer who want to search this gentleman in the street should be able to come over to any of you and say to you, I require to search this man for prohibited, prop uh, prohibited substances. And these are my grounds for requiring that search. Do you think those grounds are adequate to search him? And if you say no, then I have no grounds to commit that search. If you say yes, then I can search him. So every time I submitted somebody to a search in the street, obviously I didn't go up to local passerby and say, I want to search this guy and whatever, but I asked myself the question, are my grounds for doing this reasonable and would a reasonable member of the public think they are reasonable? Yeah? And so whenever you find that, and you also have to tell them they are entitled to a copy of the record of search any time they want it, if they apply to my police station within 12 months of the date of the search. You've never seen a policeman say anything like that on the television, have you? Never. The whole thing is illegal and our police officers are breaking the law regularly. Now when I joined the police force, I bought this. Can't get these anymore, they're not, they're not issued anymore. This is Moriarty's police law. Moriarty's police law was written by a couple of retired chief constables and some lawyers. And it goes into great detail of the law. Now I was watching a superintendent from Birmingham on the television one night and he was moaning like the clappers about the boy racers tearing up the middle of Birmingham at night. And he was saying, we need more powers to deal with this. And I'm thinking to myself, you pillock. And he's saying, we don't have the right sort of, rule, uh, right sort of laws to deal with this. And I'm thinking, you absolute pillock. 
because the 1848 ta 1847 Town Police Clauses Act, 1848 Town Police Clauses Act, section 28, says quite clearly that a constable or any person can arrest without warrant anybody driving or riding furiously to the danger or annoyance of the public. Simple. But there's no bail. You take them back to the police station and they remain in the cells until you can take them to a magistrate. So if you nick the little scroat on a Friday evening on a bank holiday, he stays banged up in the cells until Tuesday. And his nice little Golf GTI with a super deluxe hi-fi unit that deafens everybody for 50 miles, with his nice alloy wheels and his super deluxe exhaust that makes 10 times the noise it's supposed to, and his nice little spoiler on the back. That's parked by the side of the road all weekend. And when he comes back and he's got no wheels, no hi-fi system, no spoiler and no nothing, whose fault is that? He shouldn't have been tearing up Birmingham in the middle of the night, should he? If you deal with it under the Road Traffic Act, you stop him and you give him a £60 or an £80 fixed penalty ticket. That's a medal. Look what I got, fellas. I got one of these. That's a medal. How much less of a medal is it to be banged up in a police cell all weekend until you can be taken before a magistrate? 1848 18, uh, Town Police Clauses Act is still the law of England. And the reason it is the law of England, government want to get rid of it. But they can't get rid of any law which says a constable or any person because they can't remove your right to make a citizen's arrest. Because the common law of England, the constitutional law of England, enshrines that right in you for all time. They can't do it. So basically, what's happening is, we've got an old style set of laws which work very, very well. And a new style set of laws which are illegal, i.e. the crushing of your motor car. Parking tickets. Who's had a parking ticket? Yeah? Fantastic. Half the people in the room have had a parking ticket. It's illegal. When I joined the police force, I had to give out parking tickets as part of your training. I gave out the one I had to do for my training. I never gave out another one since, because as I say, I'm not a traffic policeman. I didn't see my life was here to actually annoy the motorists. I was a thief taker. I was a special constable, but I was a home beat officer. I worked in conjunction with a regular policeman who did the days. I did the nights on a main red light district in London. I was a principal officer at three murders. With one of those murders, a man who'd burnt his wife to death, I actually arrested the principal suspect. You all remember the Stephen Lawrence case, don't you? Oh, God, racism, racism, racism. Wasn't racism at all. It was the normal idiocy of police officers who don't know what day of the week it is. I had a lady on my beat. She had multiple sclerosis. One of the effects it had, apart from putting her in a wheelchair, was the fact it made her voice very low. She couldn't talk very effectively. You had to actually bend right down and put your ear, ear right next to her mouth before you could hear what she was saying. She had a very yappy Scotty Terrier. And her husband went around for weeks beforehand because he had a drink problem, she had the money and she told the bank they were only to give him 20 pounds a day. And he went around telling everybody for weeks, I'm going to burn my wife to death. Now I was the first officer at the scene. I went into the house, which had flames coming 40 foot out of the roof. I saw the fire brigade try to get into the room that she was in. They couldn't, the door was locked, there was no key in the lock. She's wheelchair bound and in the far corner of the room. She didn't have the key. 
fireman had to go out and get a short ladder and use it as a battering ram to break the door down. I went into the room with the fire brigade. They were squirting their hoses. I saw her, not very pretty sight, having fallen through the burnt rubber of her wheelchair. Uh, and she was there. At which point, the home beat officer came up to me and said to me, Albert, Rosemary Ford, her name was, very brilliant home beat officer. She said to me, go to the end of the road. You'll see a blue Ford Escort coming up the road. Find out who's in it. If it's, mis if it's her husband, arrest him on suspicion of murder. Right down the road, five minutes later, up comes a blue Ford Escort, two blokes in it. One of them was her husband. Right, you're coming with me, old son. You're mine. I then let them know that I've got him. I want transport to come and collect him. While we're there, he's crying, my wife, my wife, my wife. Not a tear in sight. Now, I know my wife actually drives me crazy on occasions. And we would, all of us fellas, wouldn't we like to throttle them on occasions? Wouldn't that feel good? Yeah? But I love her to pieces, and if she was burnt to death, I would be devastated. Absolutely devastated, and believe me, there would be tears. Don't tell her I said that, I shall deny it. All right? But there would be. And, and there were no tears. And so, two detectives come along, so I've done what they call de-arresting him, and then they have re-arrested him. And then I've gone back to the house. And several people came up to me and said, Officer, officer, we'd like to tell you that this man told us personally that he was going to burn his wife to death. And I've collected all their names and phone numbers and their addresses on a piece of paper. And I saw the inspector, and the inspector said to me, because the little dog was dead, he said, I've arranged for the council to come and take the dog. And I said, no, we don't want that. We want the dog to be posted, surely. We want to find out why the dog died. She was in the living room, that side of the house. The dog was in the bedroom, that side of the house. The dog was dead. There's very little smoke damage in the bedroom. There's practically no smoke damage in the passage because it was a very good fire door in the living room. And it's kept all of the fire into the living room. There was some damage where it started to burn through the door into the passage, but basically not a lot. The inspector said, no, nope, I've arranged for the council to come and collect it. I said, no, we don't want to do that. We want a post-mortem on that dog. We want to find why it died. It's a very yappy little dog. Why didn't it notify everybody within a five-mile radius by its barking that something was drastically wrong? He said, give it to the council. That's an order. So the council came and took the dog away. And I said to him, Right, when I get back down the police station, I've I'll, I'll, I'll completed my pocketbook entries here. I'll get down the police station, I will do an incident report book and a 991 statement. And he said, I don't want anything on you on, from you on paper. I don't want anything from you at all on paper. So I went back down the police station anyway and I filled out my, my, inf uh, my um, incident report book and I did my 991 statement. And I said, here they are. And he said, I don't want them. Throw them away. I don't want them. So I put them in my locker. Ten months later, it went to court. Two detectives stood up in court. One of them stood up in court. And he said, on day, date, time and place, I was on duty in full uniform when I saw a man I now know as. And I arrested him. And the man was freaking out in the dock. And he's saying, you lying bastard, it wasn't you. It was some special constable called Albert that arrested me. And the judge grabs for the papers, and where am I? I'm not there. So I get sent down a statement form to fill in. On day date, time and place, I was on duty in full uniform. I attended the scene of a fire. I saw some people, but I have no further recollection of what happened. Sign here, please. I ripped it up. I went to my locker. I produced a photocopy of my pocketbook. I produced an incident report book written at the, t at the time, or shortly after the time, and a 991 statement written shortly after the time. Here's my evidence. The man was not convicted of murder. Why wasn't he convicted of murder? Two reasons. Firstly, because they left me out of the case. And yet, 
anybody with more than half a brain would know I was essential to the case. I'm the first officer there. I've gone into the building with the fire brigade. I have seen them break through the door. I have gone down the road at the request of the local home beat officer and I have arrested the main suspect. I have to be in the case. But I wasn't. Why? Because of an idiot inspector. And that is what happens. The fire brigade forensic people said they couldn't produce uh, evidence of arson. The Metropolitan Police Forensic people said they could. So the Crown Prosecution Service said because of the disparity between the two forensic services and because of the fact this special constable was written out of the case when he shouldn't have been, we're going to drop the case. The man got what he wanted. He'd killed his wife. He's not been found guilty of her murder, so he inherits all of her money. The only thing I hope is he drunk himself to death in, sh death in short order. Racism in the police force, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I am saying, I have never, ever seen it. Sexism in the police force, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I have never, ever seen it. And on the rare occasions when I have seen racism, it's normally been a black police officer against a different type of black. I've never seen it with white police officers. I've never seen it sexism with white police officers. They treat the girls in the police station with respect. They treat them nicely. It's the black police officers who walk up, as one did called Perry, walked up to an inspector, a female inspector who'd asked to see him, and he walked up to her and he said, who loves your baby crunch? And she just said, in my office. That was it. I mean, she should have floored him, really, but, I mean, in my office. So, basically, racism, not responsible for the Lawrence problem. Stupidity, definitely. It happens. And it's our job as members of the public to see the police force are not allowed to be stupid. They're not allowed to do that sort of thing. They have got to actually stand up and actually do the job the way it is supposed to be done. Right, I think that's about it, really. How are we doing? <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Uh, well, I, th I think the Anti-Terrorism Act, um, A, is probably unnecessary. There's a lot of acts that are unnecessary. The Race Relations Act is completely unnecessary. Um, you know, if I, if I throw a brick through a black man's window because he's black, um, they deal with that under the Race Relations Act. If I throw a brick through a black man's window, that's criminal damage. The fact I've thrown it through his window because he is black, that aggravates the criminal damage. The English law, the ordinary English law, dealt with it nicely, thank you very much. There was no need for any other law. All the Race Relations Act has done is made an awful lot of people frightened to upset an awful lot of other people. And that shouldn't be the case. Well, ap ap no, no, I understand that. I, no, I understand that. I understand that. And I think that the, the anti-terrorism laws are being used in a manner for which they were not designed, or shouldn't have been designed. I suspect with this government they were. But they should not have been designed for that. But I also think that you have to blame not the Anti-Terrorism Act, but the individual policeman who uses it. Because the individual policeman who uses it should be sufficiently well aware of what his job is, which is, i.e., the preservation of life, the protection of property, the detection of offences and the placing before the courts of offenders, to know that that law is not appropriate to that situation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks after that last day. Yeah. And I've stopped on the base I was driving before we drive and my vehicle was stuck and was stripped down and so was I. I understand before we fall. Yeah. And once they took us off and I wasn't, I told them to be confirmed whether I was myself. So I'd done that
Right, well, basically, uh, you, you do have rights, and they can't take them away from you. You do have rights. Um, however, under the Road Traffic Act, if a police officer asks you to identify yourself, then he, in fact, has an absolute right to do that. And if you say, no, I'm not going to tell you who I am, he will simply arrest you for obstructing an officer in the execution. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, fine, fine, fine. But you're still in charge of a vehicle. And if you're asked, if you're in charge of a vehicle and a policeman asks you who you are, you have to tell him, because that's what the law says. If you don't tell him, then in fact he will arrest you. He will arrest you, you should go back to the police station, not for seven days, for Christ's sake, but only for such time as it takes to identify who you are. Because we have this thing, don't we, which is going all the rage now, that if a policeman stops your car, you must actually not tell them who you are. Because if you do, you're entering into a contract with them. Now, there's not a policeman in the country who wants to enter into a contract with you. When he stops your car, he wants to know, is it your car? Are you entitled to drive it? Is it insured? Is it road taxed? And, you know, are you stone cold sober? Yeah? That's what he wants to know. If you satisfy all them boxes, you're on your way in three minutes flat normally. If you start arguing, then you will be arrested, in which case you're going to look at the next six hours at least, locked up in a police cell, while they find out who you are and why you're being so bolshy. So, I mean, a lot of people get themselves into a lot of trouble unnecessarily, but then a lot of police officers use laws which are not applicable. Do you know what I mean? They, they do use them when common sense would say... Right, well, when, when common sense would say... I mean, I was in Ramsgate years ago, I used to do a lot of boating. And I was in Ramsgate, and a guy came in in his little yacht, and he said the customs went out to do a, a check on his boat, as customs and excise do. And they asked him for his, his documents, and he said, get lost. It's my ship, you're not coming on it. So they pulled it out of the water, they dismantled it on the, on the dockside, and they left it, his engine all in pieces, the propeller shaft out, everything, all in pieces on the dockside. And when they found nothing in it that was contraband, and he said, well, what about putting it back together? And they said, no, that's your job now. That's your job. You've, you were difficult with us. We've stripped, we've searched your boat. It's not our job to put it back together. We only dismantle it to find out whether, why you're being difficult. You, you know, you're being difficult because you're stupid. That's fine. Now you put it back together. And, and, and it, it's, it depends on the policeman you get. And also, of course, all policemen are human. So when you've got out of bed because you haven't had any sleep last night because the wife's been having a go at you over something that you've done or she imagines that you've done more often than not, and you, you, you come to work, you're in a flaming bad mood with the wife, and you go out on the beat and the first thing you do is you stop a car because it's broken the law somewhere, it's turned left where it shouldn't, and all you get is a mouthful of abuse from the driver and a total lack of co cooperation. You're not supposed to react to that but policemen are human. And sometimes we all of us want to hit something. And they don't actually hit you, but what they do do is they hit you with the full force of the law. And it's 90% it's your own fault, because basically, if you spoke to the man in a reasonable manner, he'd say, or oh, at least he's being reasonable, not like that so-and-so I've got at home. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and you can do a thing. I mean. It depends upon how, how you approach things. I was going on the beat one day and I had a jumper. Lady came up to me and she said, Officer, officer, look at that man up there. And he was sat on the balcony. Now, my first wife suffered very severely with premenstrual tension and depression. She was homicidal and suicidal. I lived with her for 14, 13 years before I divorced her. I had, I had enough. I took 13 years. I'm a slow learner. And, and uh, so basically, I went up there and I said, What's the problem, old son? He said, don't come near me. He said, I'm going to jump. I said, I'm not coming near you. And I sat on the floor and leaned up against the wall and said, right, tell me all about it. Oh, it's my wife. She's doing this. She's doing that. Doing that. I can't beat that. And I told him a story about my first wife. And he said, well, she's doing this and that and the other. I said, no, I can beat that. And I told him another story about my first wife. And after half an hour ago, this, he got off the wall and he came and he said, come on, you need a pint more than I do. <laughs> and we went into his flat and we spent the next half an hour drinking beer and chatting. So, but basically, policing is common sense. It's 100% common sense, policing. 
uh, a certain amount of knowledge of the law, but mainly common sense. And basically, if you walk down a road and you see something going on and you think it's illegal, then the chances are that it is. And it's the same for policemen. Simon was made, particularly with Section 44. Yes, well... If, if you take um, the, the, uh, the film Take the Liberties, there's, there's, there's part of that... I haven't seen the, that. The, ...the coaches that were going up yeah. to Fairford. Yeah. That were harassed. Yeah. And turned back. Yes. Under quite ridiculous circumstances. So yeah. It's not down to individual policemen or policewomen to use Section 44 for reasons of that nature. <coughs> Well, it is and it isn't. If your inspector says to you, right, we're going out, we're going to stop all these coaches on the motorway going near there and everywhere else, somebody should say to him, why? Why? Because I, I had a guy once, I was walking around the beat and I took a call and there was a woman who was about 35, very, very tasty, very, very fit, and she said to me, I've been raped. And I said, oh, really, my love, do you know who did it? And she said, yes, it was him over there. And walking down the other road, side of the road, was a man with a dog. He was grossly, grossly overweight, even fatter than me. And, and he suffered very badly with emphysema, I found out. He could hardly put one foot in front of the other, neither could his dog, which was also grossly overweight. And I looked at him and I looked at her and I thought, absolutely no way. No way at all. She could crawl on her hands and knees faster than he could run. There is no way that he's raped her. So anyway, I've got her shot off to the rape sweep because that's what I have to do. And I went over to the guy and I said to him, I'd like you to come down to the police station, please. I've had this allegation and I need you to help me with my inquiries. And he said to me, I haven't done anything. I'm not going anywhere. And I said, well, look, it's a serious allegation, old son. I've got to investigate it and I need you down the police station. So let me put it like this, if you come with me now of your own volition, then you don't have to answer any questions if you don't want to, you're entitled to legal aid free if you want it, and in fact you can leave whenever you get fed up with it. And he said, I said, otherwise I have to arrest you, in which case you get the free legal advice, you don't have a choice about coming with me and you definitely can't leave when you're ready. And he said to me, put like that, I'll come down the police station. So we got a van up, we took him down to the police station. I went up to the CID office, Detective, C said, Detective Sergeant said to me, where's your prisoner? I said, I haven't got a prisoner, I've got a man who's come in to help me with my inquiries. And he said to me, but you have to arrest him. I said, no I don't, he's come in perfectly happily on his own, I don't believe he's done it anyway, and I'm not prepared to arrest him. And he said, go back there now and arrest him. That's an order. And I said, hold on a minute. I hold the office of constable. Before I arrest somebody, I have to have reasonable grounds for believing that they have committed an offence. And I don't think he's capable. So I don't have reasonable grounds and I'm not arresting him. So I, in fact, am not going to do it. So he sent somebody else along who arrested him. And that's the difference in the police force. Some policemen will argue, some won't. They questioned her that day. They questioned her at 10 o'clock the following morning, got a different story. They questioned her at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, got a different story. Over three days they questioned her. Every time they questioned her, got a different story. At the end of the time, she admitted that she'd been out with the girls all night on the beer. She didn't want to go home and tell her husband she'd been out with the girls all night on the beer. So she thought he'd stand it better if, she thought, if he thought she'd been raped. So it didn't happen. What didn't happen, what should have happened, is that she should have been charged with um, wasting police time, at the very least. But she didn't, she wasn't. So, so basically, it's a question of the individual policeman whether he's prepared to accept an order which he believes to be unlawful or not. Regarding wasting police time, surely police time was wasted incredibly on the Fairford bus from London. Well, absolutely. 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 
Um, and, and, and in, but you see, there are not enough police officers up there. As I said, every single police constable in this country, in England and Wales, is answerable to the law and only to the law. Every single one of them. And in fact, there are not enough police officers who will stand up and say, no, I'm not doing that, because the law says I don't have to, or the law says I shouldn't. I am not doing that. There are not enough police officers who will do that. What they do is they say, yes, Governor, and away they go and they do it because it's not their responsibility anymore. It becomes the inspector's responsibility, or the superintendent who's told them. But the fact of the matter is, they seem to forget the Nuremberg defence doesn't work. I was only doing what I was told, said the Gestapo officers at the concentration camps. But we hung them anyway. The Nuremberg defence does not work. It didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. What we have to do is make sure that our police officers uphold the oath that they took to do their job without fear or favour, malice or ill will. And if they do that, that will be fine. Yes, sir? How are you going to make them do it? Well, you have to talk to them. You have to explain to them that you're unhappy with the standard of policing. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's easy. You start a neighbourhood watch-up, and then when you've got your neighbourhood watch-up and running, or, or a residence association, you start one of them, and when you've got it up and running, or a group like Pusey, which is up and running, and then what you do is you write a letter to your local superintendent, and you say, we are having a series of meetings, and we would like you to attend because we are discussing policing, and we'd like you to give the police point of view. And when, people, when the man comes here and he's out in front of you and you all have a go at him, he's powerless. He can't do anything. He can't do anything. He can't lock you all up, for God's sake. He's on camera anyway. But, I mean, basically, you then read the riot act to him and you make it perfectly plain to your local superintendent that unless you get the quality of policing which you insist upon, it is his job you are going for. It's taken him 20 years to become a superintendent. So it is his job you're going for. It is his pension you want to make sure he doesn't get. And if you do that and you can convince him that you are serious, he will go back to the police station and he will tell his officers what they have to do. I had an inspector. Actually, it was the same inspector who did the inquiry in, into the um, Kelly murder. Because I believe it was a murder. And this man, he was an acting inspector at the time, which meant he was a sergeant. And I had a ruck with Thames Valley Police over their phone service, which is completely non-user friendly, as I'm sure is the phone service in Wiltshire. And they, I wanted to hand some property in that I'd found, and I went to the police station, it was shut. So I phoned the police station, no answer, just an answer phone. So I then... Um, thought to myself, I'm getting really sick of this, I'm going to find a policeman and I'm going to ram this piece of property right down the back of his throat. Actually, it was a nice leather coat. I'm going to ram it down the back of his throat. The first police car I saw was actually an armed response vehicle. So I've stood on my horn until he looked my way and then I've gone to him, you over there, in my best traffic officer's manner, and he went round the roundabout and parked up, and I parked up, and I explained it all to him. And he said to me, I know exactly what you're thinking. I had a puncture this morning when I come out. I had to phone the police station, let them know I was going to be half an hour late while I changed the tyre. I couldn't get through. All I could get was a bloody answer phone. He said, but I'll tell you what, he said, in the police station, there was a sergeant and two constables now. I'll take you back in. So we drove, I followed him back into the police station where the guy put the uh, coat into the book and re recorded it in into the lost property book. And then, as I was going out, I saw a policeman I knew and I said to him, Aidan, why don't you answer the phones? And he said to me, oh no, we don't answer the phones after five o'clock at night or before nine o'clock in the morning. I said to him, no Aidan, that's not the point. The point is that 
People like me who are employed in industry are paying money to pay your wages. And among other things, we're paying your wages to answer the phones. If the phones ring, pick the bloody things up. And he said to me, no, no, we don't do it. I said, Aidan, pick them up. And I went away and I wrote a nice letter to Kidlington Force Headquarters complaining about this. And they sent me this acting inspector. And I arranged to meet him where I work, because the governor goes to London on a Wednesday, so come see me at work, that way I don't have to lose any time off work and I can make a cup of tea and we can sit down and have a chat. And he walked in and he said, of course we don't answer the phones between nine o'clock and, or five o'clock and nine o'clock. I said, no, 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 that's not the system. People like me employed in industry pay an awful lot of money in rates and taxes to pay your wages. Among other things, we're paying you to answer the phones. If they ring, pick the bloody things up. And he said to me, no, no, he said, well, we've got the answer phones. I said, OK, I am the village idiot. I phone you a hundred times a day with idiot calls. The one time I genuinely need a policeman in a rush, I leave the message on your answer phone because it's the only way I've got of contacting you. But I genuinely need a policeman in a rush. You recognise my voice and without even listening to the message, you wipe the tape. What sort of a service are you giving me? And he said to me, no, no, he said, well, it doesn't quite work like that. He said, but I said, you're not using the phones to screen your work, the answer phones to screen your work. And he said to me, no, no, he said, but we don't answer the phones. We've got these answer machines. I said, OK, let's try this one. I'm an 80-year-old woman. 20 years ago, I lost my dog. In order to find out whether my dog had been found, I wrote the police station's phone number in my book. Today, I'm 80. I have just been burgled, seriously sexually assaulted and beaten up. I'm old, I'm frail, I'm frightened. I know there is a number I should phone when I want a policeman at a rush, but I am confused and I can't remember it. But I do know that I've got the police station's phone number written in my book. And what do I get? I get your harridan on the switchboard who wants to know the ins and outs of my business. And when I eventually get past your harridan on the switchboard, what do I get? I get an answer phone. What sort of a service are you giving me? You are giving me no service whatsoever. If the phones ring, pick the bloody things up. And he said to me, I'll tell you what I'll do, he said. I'll go back to the police station and I'll ask my police officers if they would mind answering the phones. I said, you don't get this, do you? You're having a real problem understanding this. I pay your wages. I am your employer. As your employer, I am telling you that you will go back to the police station and you will tell your officers that they will answer the phones if they ring. If they don't want to do that, I'm not prepared to subsidise their standard of living any longer. They can go and find another job. And if you're not prepared to tell them, I'm not prepared to sub subsidise you either. Now, basically, you're talking on deaf ears. It's falling on deaf ears. So you need to go to the top. You need to get your local divisional superintendent or chief superintendent down at a meeting and you need to give him a hard time. The harder, the better. When I was policing, I used to walk around the beat and I'd talk to people who were unhappy about policing and I'd say, well, how much are you insisting upon getting a good standard of policing? And they said, well, what do you mean? So how often do you go down the police station and have a rant at them? And they said, well, never. And I said, well, you get the standard of policing that you insist upon. If you don't insist upon a high standard of policing, you won't get it. But if you do insist upon a high standard of policing, you will get it. And if you put complaints in on a regular basis about your local police, they'll get fed up with the complaints department looking over their shoulder all the time, and they'll think, oh, God, it's that Mrs Jones again from Currington Avenue. We'll get round there a bit smartish. Yeah? My son, Peter, when he was nine, he used to play football for a little team on a weekend. They were training. The mother phoned me up. I was divorced from her by then. The mother phoned me up and she said, I'm very concerned about Peter. The guy who picks him up in the car, he's got four boys in the car with Peter, 
and he's saying things about Peter's bigger sister, who was 14 at the time, and what her she's getting up to with her boyfriend, it's upsetting Peter. So I said, I can't come round. And I went round, and I said to him, what's happening, Pete? And he told me what the story was. Uh, and who else was in the car? Well, there was Harry, there was George, there was Fred, there was whatever. So I went, come on, we'll go and find them. So I went up to these kids, we found them in the street, and I said to them, right, one at a time, I said to them, right, I'm Peter's dad, but I'm also a policeman. Can you tell me, please, what's going on in the car? What's being said in the car? And individually, they all told me the same thing. And I said to them, right, I want you to go home now, straight home, tell your mum that I've spoken to you, and tell her that another policeman will be coming to talk to you, but she will have to be there when the other policeman talks to you. So go home and do that right now. And then I went back and I phoned the police from the local, from my ex-wife's house and I said, I need to see a policeman, I want to report an offence. They said, what is it? So I told them and they said, well, there's no offence. I said, well, you won't know till you get here, will you? So they came and they said, OK, we'll send somebody around. Well, two hours later, nobody had arrived. So I phoned them again and I said to them, what's happening? They said, oh, we discussed it. We decided there's no offence, there's no point in going. I said, if I haven't got a little man in a blue pointed hat standing in front of me in five minutes, my next phone call will be to the complaints department at Scotland Yard. The police car, when it came, came round the corner with the blues and twos going on on two wheels. Two police officers got out, very officious, clipboard, listened to what I had to say, and he said to me, it was no offence, there's nothing we can do. Well, in the Metropolitan Police, if a child comes to the attention of the police, you form, fill in what they call a Form 78. If it's because he's helped some old lady in, from, uh, who's been run over in the street, you fill it in, it goes to the Youth and Community Department, they take it to the Chief Superintendent, the Chief Superintendent writes him a nice letter of commendation because he's done something nice. If it's because you caught the little scrote, he's drunk, uh, uh, or he's been shoplifting, or he's out with his mother who is drunk, then it goes through all the channels and it goes through social services and everybody else. And I said to the guy, there's absolutely nothing you can do. And he said, no, nothing at all. I said, you're absolutely certain about that? And he said, yeah, absolutely. And I said to him, oh, really? What about a Form 78 on the youth club? And he looked at me and you could see enlightenment dawning. And I said, yes, you're absolutely right. I am Job. Now, I don't care whether this is investigated by you or by me. It's on your division's grounds, so I'm giving you an opportunity to investigate it. But I tell you now, it will be investigated, it, and if I investigate it, there's going to be a bigger bloody bang in West Hampstead Police Station than there ever was at Hiroshima. So they went away, and the next thing you know, my son gets a, an interview with the police, and they ask him what's going on. And the next thing we know, we've got to go to Southwark Crown Court because the guy has been arrested. Fortunately, he hadn't laid a finger on my son. Two of the other boys he had committed serious sexual assaults on. If I hadn't insisted that that was looked at, then in fact it would have gone on and eventually my son would probably have been a victim along with everybody else. So you insist upon the standard of policing that you want, and if you insist hard enough, you will get it. Because the police don't like people complaining about them. It's hard work for them. They can lose their pension, they can lose their job. They can even, in certain circumstances, go to prison. So basically, insist upon a high standard of policing and the best way to start that is to have a meeting and get the man here himself and give him a hard time so you invite your local divisional superintendent the inspector for the area and the local beat policeman you get the three of them down the superintendent will tell the inspector he's not going to these places to get harangued like that again sort it the inspector will tell the policeman, sort it. It's typical, isn't it? Captain gets a headache, so eventually the ship's boy ends up kicking the cat. Right? It gets passed down the line. You don't care where it goes to. All you want to know is that when you ask for a policeman, you get a policeman. When you get him, he is efficient and does the job properly. 
insist upon a high standard. Anybody else? Any more questions on that? Yes, sir. Have you seen the film taken with this? I haven't, no. Well, the basically, there are some cer certain things which concern me greatly about the police today. Very concerned about the oath, for starters. I'm also very concerned about the fact that in the past, when I joined the police force, you had to be either a, uni a, a United Kingdom subject or a subject from the Commonwealth. Either way, you shared the same sovereign that we have. Nowadays, they've done away with that, so you can, in fact, become a police officer from anywhere in the world. Now, this is particularly dangerous, because at the moment, there is a great groundswell of resistance building up in this country about what government are doing. Quite rightly, because what government are doing is treason. There is no doubt about it. It fits the definition of treason word for word. They have decimated a food-producing industry. If you allow the food producing in this country down so far that you cannot feed your own people, that is definition of tree. They have decim decimated our manufacturing industry. If you cannot manufacture the necessary goods and things for your own population to use, that in fact is a definition of treason. If in fact you allow your armed forces to be so degraded that they are incapable of defending your own country, that in fact is treason. Now, we don't have any production methods to produce guns, ammunition, tanks, aircraft to renew the equipment our armed forces use, to buy it in. We buy it from the French, the Germans, the Spanish, and anybody else will sell it to us. All of the people that we maybe get to go to war with. It's no sense, does it? Why would you want to buy German guns and fire German bullets where if you can end up with a war with Germany, they just send it, you stop sending it to you. you? You can't win, can you? So basically these things are treason. There are breaches of the Constitution which are treason. The treason is the Constitution is being subverted on such a scale that it's being degraded so badly that in fact we are now living in very dangerous times because the Constitution put there by our forefathers who were not stupid built the Constitution in such a way to give us all the protections we were ever likely to need. House of Lords lost their, per their ability to throw out a bill in 1911, again in 1948 it was, it was changed again. 1911, they could only hold it up for three years, 1948 only up for two years. After that they've gone. All of the hereditary peers have been thrown out of the House of Lords. Completely illegal. They have a letters patent from the Sovereign, uh, some of these letters patents go back hundreds and hundreds of years, but they entitle any Lord with a letters patent to sit in the House of Lords, they've been thrown out. That is illegal, it's unconstitutional. Restricting the powers of the Lords, unconstitutional. Removing the Royal pro Prerogative from the Queen, unconstitutional, therefore illegal. <coughs> Politicians are overtaxing us, definitely overtaxing us. They are robbing us blind. That's just a simple fraudulent accounting. When you go and claim 18, 16,800 pounds for a mortgage, which you don't have, that's fraud, isn't it? You committed fraud, the policeman would come and feel your collar, wouldn't he? He'd take you away, you'd go to prison. Members of Parliament, we can do what we like. We are Parliament, we can do what we like. They can't, they are governed by the Constitution the same as everybody else. What Parliament are doing is they are ignoring the existence of the Constitution. They are ignoring Magna Carta. They are ignoring the Bill of Rights. They are ignoring habeas corpus. Well, this is much more, this is much more. Habeas corpus, <coughs> Bill of Rights, so right to privacy. Right. And, and, and what they're doing is by doing all of these things, they are making the people want to rebel. Now, we are a people who regularly rebel. Um, not every week, but every few hundred years we rebel. Edward III, Ed Edward II, they killed with a red-hot poker up his backside so it didn't show any move, any, any wounds. <laughs> Charles I, we chopped his head off. James II, we forced to flee the country. Right? We, we actually are not averse to killing our kings if they get in the way and if they do things which are wrong. Henry I, 
generally acknowledged as a reasonably good king, was forced to sign the Charter of Liberties because he wanted to rule by divine right and we said no. Government are bringing in European legislation into this country. It is illegal. Has been since the days of Alfred the Great. The Pope wanted, when Alfred became king, to put an archbishop into this country. Alfred had a guy that he wanted for himself. The Pope sent an archbishop over to say, I am now England's archbishop. Alfred returned him saying, thank you very much, but no thanks, I've got my own man. The Pope returned him with a message to tell Alfred that in fact, I am the Pope. I appoint every king on the planet. If you don't do what I tell you, I'll sack you and I'll appoint somebody else. Alfred returned the Archbishop again and he said, I was elected king by the English. I will only ever do what the English want. Right? If you would like me to do something, ask me nicely and I will consider it. Tell me what I'm going to do and I will tell you to get lost. Now Alfred was a Roman Catholic. The Pope accepted it. Several other kings have had problems with the Pope and in fact they did it. Elizabeth I, the Pope, said that anybody who killed Elizabeth I would not suffer any penalties for murder. He would be uh, rewarded for killing Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I brought in the Act of Supremacy which her father had had, she updated it and the Act of Supremacy which put her as the head of the Church of England also made it a treasonable offence for anybody to attempt the life of the Queen. Okay, so basically this is what we've got. We've got a government now which is stealing the royal authority from the Queen. The Queen is no longer in a position to do anything to help us. We have to help the Queen. A lot of people say, well, of course, the Queen's involved in the treason. And, of course, maybe she is. I personally don't think she is, but maybe she is. But even if she were, we can't touch the Queen because too many people love the girl. But what do you intend to do about it? What do we intend to do about it? We want to try... Um, this was actually going to be for my next talk, but I'll, I'll give you a brief thing. I have evidence of the treason of the Heath government. Very good evidence, all on official government papers. And basically what we want to do is to actually get people all over the country to take this evidence into their local police station and say, I want to report a crime. Now the local police station will initially tell you to get lost. You then say, OK, fine, um, I'd like to see an inspector. What do you want to see an inspector for? Well, I propose to report you for a serious neglect of duty for failing to record an investigation, an allegation of serious crime when required to do so, and the criminal offence of misprison of treason. Of course, if you want to go to prison for the rest of your life, I don't care. Right? They will then come in and take the complaint. The ch complaints department will sling it out. So you then find out by writing letters, and you get all these letters back which are evidence, you then in fact submit this package and you go to your next police force across the border and you want to say, I want to put in a complaint of compounding trees against PC so-and-so from this police station, inspector so-and-so, superintendent so-and-so from the complaints department and the chief constable for compounding treason. And the idea is to get every single police force in this country investigating every other police force in this country for compounding treason. Sooner or later, a chief superintendent, a chief constable is going to look at this and he's going to say, hang on a minute, this is dangerous. I can lose my job, my pension, and I can spend the rest of my life in prison. Do I really want to do that in order to keep a retired member of Heath's government out of jail? I probably don't even like the man. Do I really want to do that? And the answer, of course, is no. And the minute he says, no, I don't, he picks up his phone to his best detective, says, get in here, I want this investigated. Now, when your local police in Wiltshire say to you, well, you know, we're not in the best position to deal with this, you say, that's fine, don't care. You record it as a crime, give me a crime book number and forward it to the Metropolitan Police to deal with it if you want to. Because what I want is every police force in the country to forward these allegations to the Metropolitan Police. The Metropolitan Police are then in a difficult position because they say we've got every police force in the country, all 43 of them apart from us, are 